For centuries, novelists and others have argued that there is a fine line between love and hate. So far, this assumption has been based solely on the intensity of both emotions and explained how a person can love someone when they get married and hate them when they get divorced. Now, in July 2013, Professor Samir Ziki of University College London has published a scientific study, published in the online journal PLOS1, conducted under his supervision, showing that there is a biological basis for the relationship between these most powerful human emotions. Magnetic resonance imaging and other studies show that they are closely related because some of the same neural circuits in the brain are activated in response to what may seem to be opposite feelings. But what about attraction as opposed to romantic love? Can a person feel lust for someone he hates? Both in academia and in real life, I, Greg Nelson, have come across this question. I was adopted by a loving couple when I still couldn't remember anything. I was told that I was four months old. After my foster father had several affairs, they stopped loving each other, and my foster mother divorced him when I was five years old. I almost never saw him again. However, my mother's brother was still a great father to me, and his wife was almost a second mother. My aunt and uncle have always treated me well for the significant amount of time I spent with them throughout high school, especially when my mom had to work or had problems with her life. They were provided for, made sure that I didn't need anything, and even paid for part of my college tuition. However, the most important thing was the love they gave me. With the exception of my mom, aunt, and uncle, I was always underestimated as a child and often as an adult. It was and still is because of my physique. No matter what I do, I will never have a saggy waistline. I have what almost everyone who mentions it has, a beautiful face with penetrating ice blue eyes and attractive, for women, silky blonde hair, but my body clearly lacks the tone of the muscles of the torso. Due to the apparent lack of muscle tone in my body, I was bullied at school until rumors started that maybe I didn't really know much about tests. Although my hands were not particularly fast, the strength of my upper body was impossible to believe, given my appearance, but if I got to the opponent, he would be finished. This became especially noticeable after my uncle, who received a black belt in judo as a teenager, taught me several submission techniques and choke techniques that matched my strengths. My main problem as a child was that I wasn't bullied by boys at school and that I didn't have a father at home. Rather, my main problem, unfortunately, was the black spot of my aunt and uncle. It was their eldest daughter, Amber. My aunt and uncle's son, Josh, who was a year younger than me, and their youngest daughter, Brittany, who was three years younger than me, were not only cousins, but also good friends. Amber who was two years older than me, was and remains the most conceited, nasty, venomous likeness of a human being imaginable. Although Amber also mistreated Josh and Brittany, it was nothing like how she treated me. She called me all the insulting names she could think of. For most people, insults are just an expression of speech. In her case, she actually kept a spiral notebook with offensive comments and phrases that she came up with, heard from others, or learned from reading trashy novels, just about me. One of her favorite things was telling me that my biological parents didn't want me because I was a piece of shit, and that my foster father ran away because he couldn't stand me, and that my mother only pretended to love me because she felt sorry for me. It wasn't until I turned 13 that my mother finally convinced me that everything Amber had said was bullshit. It was then that I found out about my foster father's adventures. Amber also liked to make fun of me, for example, spitting into my sandwich after my aunt made it and before it hit the table pouring honey on me or sprinkling itch powder on me when I spent the night at my aunt and uncle's house, and spreading disgusting false rumors about me at school. Her favorite rumor, which she adhered to for years, was that I satisfied small animals with my organ, which was only five centimeters long. At least the guys I went to physical education with knew that the latter was not true, since I was always in good shape, but many guys were ready to believe what Amber told them. One of Amber's favorite tricks was to politely ask me to do something for her in front of my aunt or uncle. She knew how much I adored them. I knew they would never think badly of her, and I knew how much it annoyed me to have to run errands for her. Amber will surely make sure that I don't do what I promised in the presence of my aunt or uncle. Oh, Greg, do you remember when you promised to fix the flat tire on my bike? Have you done that yet? Honey? She asked in a pleasant sing-song voice. This was typical of her sophisticated approach. She always got away with everything, in the end. 
I just accepted it as my life situation. Although Amber was rude to almost everyone she thought she couldn't use in any way, she seemed to take special pleasure in trying to make my life unbearable for reasons I could never understand. I also couldn't understand how my aunt and uncle, usually such smart and astute people, could not see evil in their eldest daughter. It must have been her pretty innocent face and the way she constantly fawned over her parents, as well as her success in school and sports. Even though she was a terrible person, she got excellent grades and was probably the most athletic member of our extended family. Up to this point, the happiest day of my life was when Amber went to college out of state. However, even then she called her parents and asked them to ask me to do some menial work for her. At least I didn't have to talk to her in person. My birthday is in the summer. The day after my 18th birthday, my aunt and uncle threw a party in my honor at home for friends and relatives. Despite the fact that Amber came home from college for the summer holidays, she could not condescend to attend them, although apparently she returned from some trip with friends before it ended, because meeting her that day changed my life. Since the bathroom on the ground floor was occupied, I went to the bathroom upstairs in my aunt and uncle's house at about 9 o'clock in the evening on the day of the party, which was already coming to an end. The bathroom door was ajar, so I assumed there was no one there. It was a large bathroom with a bathtub and a large space behind the door. My male organ was half aroused because one of my friends at a party recently made some provocative remarks, and I relieved myself with my eyes closed, thinking about what else I could do with my organ after the party was over. Why are you barging in here? You're invading my personal life, dear Amber's pleasant voice rang out. She was standing completely naked next to the bathroom, with her hands on her hips, and did not even try to cover herself. My flow of pleasure has dried up, but the organ has become firmer. In all the years we've been cousins, I've never seen Amber in anything more revealing than a one-piece swimsuit. Although I had heard from guys in high school and from my own observations that Amber had a stunning body, which I never really paid attention to, so great was my antipathy to her, I was not prepared for what I saw. I had no doubt that she had, in my opinion, perfect female forms. She had firm, medium-sized breasts, a smooth, though far from skinny torso, slender hips. Her nakedness emphasized the slimness of her long legs, even for a person with her height of 180 centimeters, topped with graceful hips, which I had never paid attention to before. And despite the mockery, her face, framed by wet shiny brown hair and highlighted by the flickering light reflected in her large green eyes, was, as always, gorgeous which contradicted the nature of the brazen bitch inside. I was speechless. However, apparently my organ had grown in my hand, because I felt some kind of tingling sensation, and when I looked down, it was fully ready. Well, at least I'm glad to see that the rumors that I'm spreading about you having a 5-centimeter male organ are not true, but it won't help you at all, because no woman will allow such a disgusting person like you to shove this thing inside herself, she growled in a disgusting tone. For the first time in my life, at least in my memory, Amber's insults not only did not hurt me, but also aroused me. Also, one of the few times I could remember snapping back at her. It was hard for me to think straight the rest of the night. My organ remained firm, and I'm sure I had a glazed expression on my face. Judy, a friend who made provocative comments about me, noticed my predicament. She smiled devilishly at me, looking at my crotch and licking her lips. Less than an hour later, Judy was bent over a picnic table in a deserted park halfway between my aunt's house and her own, and I satisfied her for a very long time while she moaned and scratched the table. I imagined Amber's gorgeous body in my mind as I ruthlessly brought Judy to tears before exploding inside her and actually putting her in a coma for a good 30 seconds. When I sat down next to Judy on the bench, her dress now covered her lower body, but her panties were lying on the ground and my organ was still sticking out, and Judy was shining on it. She said, Damn it, Greg. I'm sorry, I replied, embarrassed. Judy's answer is, When can we do it again? Surprised me after her comment, It will never be the same again. When she saw the gleam in my eyes, she laughed, pinched my nose and said, Not today, lad. I need time to recover. How about Tuesday? Neither Judy nor I saw a long future for ourselves but we enjoyed satisfying each other a couple of times a week until the summer was over and we went to different colleges. Most of the time when I was caressing Judy, 
I was furiously satisfying Amber in my mind. Fortunately, Judy loved rudeness, because otherwise the first time would have been the last. When I was in my second year of college, Amber was getting married. I felt sorry for the poor guy until I met him. His name was George. He was about my height, 185 centimeters, 100 kilograms, although with six abs instead of a noticeable belly, which I always carried with me, and which was the main reason that people underestimated me. He was also very good looking. However, he was just as much an asshole as Amber. They deserve each other, I thought after a five minute conversation with this smug, arrogant, sarcastic jerk. In the run up to the wedding, Amber took to new heights her disgusting habit of sending me on assignments in front of her parents. I could barely work for the summer. It took so much time to complete her endless assignments. The only time I persevered was when she asked me to do something for George, and the only payback for that was that I accidentally caught her, and sometimes the bridesmaids, trying on various outfits and was almost naked. I was an usher at the ceremony, danced my ass off at the reception, and even picked up one of the tipsy bridesmaids in an empty conference room next to the hotel ballroom where the reception was taking place. The only drawback was that Amber looked so damn attractive that my organ was constantly straining in my pants, and the bridesmaid liked it when it was gentle, so I couldn't imagine satisfying Amber. In the summer, a year after Sweet Amber and George got married, George threw a pool party at my aunt and uncle's house, with their permission, while they were out of town. My mom was there, George and Brittany with their boyfriends, me and my girlfriend, as well as a lot of mutual friends of all ages. Amber and George kindly graced us with their presence around the middle of the party. Amber had obviously had a drink before the party and downed two martinis during it. Despite all my attempts to avoid her a besides, I was wearing mirrored sunglasses, and it was easier to look at her in a bikini from afar. She and George cornered me. She started telling me that they needed my help to move into another apartment in two weekends. Her parents weren't there, and I was still angry that I was the errand boy at her wedding, and her tone was more commanding than pleading, so I exploded. I'm not your errand boy anymore, I snapped at her. Listen, shit with brains. You're going to help, or I'm going to tell mom and dad that you're being a jerk to me. I'm done with your games. Tell them what you want, I growled. You have no right to talk to my wife like that, man, George growled threateningly. Fuck you, George. You're an asshole just like her. I snapped back, throwing my sunglasses aside. George swung at me and delivered a glancing blow to my left cheekbone. He would have had to knock me out to get a chance. I pounced on him like a stink on shit, knocked him to the ground and performed a choke hold from behind. I squeezed him harder, teasing him. Did you lose the fight, you bag of shit? You don't look much like a man, do you? When George cursed me and Amber pounded on my arms and shoulders trying to get me to let him go, I got angry and knocked him unconscious before letting go. At first, Amber approached him and fawned over him. After I made fun of her with words, it's nothing serious, Amber. Just his pride. I wouldn't want to deprive you of the only jerk who was stupid enough to marry you. She jumped up and started hitting me in the face. I grabbed her hands and held them out in front of me. Stop waving Amber around. It's going to hurt you. She spat in my face, so I dragged her to the side of the pool and threw her into the water. When this happened, her bikini top accidentally fell off. As soon as she got out, she put on a real show, running around the pool deck topless until finally, she was laughingly pointed out to lack of clothes and she covered herself up. Unfortunately, damn it, she has great breasts was the main thought that was spinning in my head. With the help of my mom and Brittany, George was brought to his senses, and he and Amber left the party in a rage. Surprisingly, or maybe not, no one else left. After Amber left, Josh, Brittany, and a few friends patted me on the back and said, great job, Greg. It was great to see these assholes humiliated, or something like that. Even my mom didn't judge me. I wish this hadn't happened, darling, was her only comment. Then she kissed me on the bruise on my left cheek. My date seemed to be into the celebration, not turned off, because before the party was over, she dragged me into the pool equipment shed and made her satisfy. The reason I mention the study on the relationship between hate and love in the second paragraph of this story, despite the fact that I am writing it in the same month that the study was published, is that I knew about it in advance. 
Two other scientific studies were conducted in tandem by researchers from England and the USA. One of the other studies was on romantic love versus lust, and a study I volunteered in about 16 months ago was on lust versus hate. Despite the fact that no conclusions have yet been drawn in the last two studies, the researchers, psychologists, as well as doctors and MRI technicians, have given me important feedback about my participation. Of the approximately 25 people studied to date, I have by far the strongest reaction of lust and hatred to Amber's photos. It seems that the brain circuits that I activate when I view photos of her in a bikini or a sultry dress cover the entire set of chains of hatred and lust in the ordinary male brain. I also received free and formal psychological counseling on how to handle my situation. When my aunt and uncle returned from a trip out of town, they found out about an argument between me, Amber, and George at a pool party. Obviously, my mom, Josh, and Brittany had properly prepared them because they didn't assume that I was to blame. However, my uncle insisted that I come to dinner with him, my aunt, Amber, and George on the weekend after the incident. My uncle stressed the importance of getting things sorted out in the family, sympathized with both me and these jerks, and made us shake hands. Amber was just a sucker. Despite the fact that Amber was an adult, her extravagance and pseudo-extravagant regime required my aunt and uncle to subsidize her and George's lifestyle until her grandparents' trust fund started working when she turned 30. After that dinner, when I was in the presence of others, I tried to be nice to Amber and George. In private, I had nothing to say to George, and Amber and I continued to exchange insults. My intelligence was also often underestimated because of my physique, but I wasn't stupid. I graduated from engineering school in four years and received a partial academic scholarship after my freshman year. So my aunt and uncle didn't have to spend so much money on my education. When I graduated from high school, I had four job offers. I didn't want to settle for the best, even though it was in my hometown. The reason I didn't want to accept a lucrative offer from XYZ Corporation was because Amber also worked there. She was involved in public relations, and there was sometimes interaction between public relations and engineering, especially when introducing new products. I hated repeating school gossip when Amber told everyone who listened that I had a 5-centimeter organ that I used to satisfy animals. My uncle persuaded me to use my brains and accept XYZ's offer. When he informed Amber of my decision in my presence, a devilish smile appeared on her lips, and she falsely congratulated me. At XYZ, I found out that Amber was an attractive target for several account managers. Amber had a reputation for being a slut in high school and college, but as far as I knew, she was only cheating on them and wasn't going to cheat on George. However, her teasing was unpleasant. Then there was a Christmas party, to which the couple were not invited. Although I didn't pay much attention because I was courting Jessica, an attractive divorced woman from accounting who was about five years older than me, I couldn't help but notice how drunk Amber was. This was unusual because she usually tolerated alcohol very well. In fact, I've never seen her drunk before, only high. When three of my familiar account managers, who were interested in her and whom she teased mercilessly, helped her out of the hotel dining room, I thought that perhaps something more than alcohol was the cause of her indisposition. There was a classic battle between good and evil going on in my head as I tried to decide whether to be happy that Amber was going to screw up or despite my antipathy towards her, to stop it. I made the decision when Jessica obviously noticed it too and commented on it to me. By the time I left the dining room, the elevator doors were already closing behind the four of them. Fortunately, he stayed on the second floor, where the guys apparently rented a room. I ran up the stairs, and Jessica kicked off her high-heeled shoes and followed me. I got to them before the door to their room was bolted shut. I pushed her. What the hell is going on here? I asked a rhetorical question, noticing that Amber was already without a blouse with a bra and was lying on the bed. None of your damn business, Nelson, the largest of the three said, pushing me in the chest. A serious mistake. One of the rules of submission, which my uncle taught me, was developed just for such cases. I quickly covered his hands while they were on my chest, knelt down and leaned forward, breaking his wrist. The other two jerks rushed towards me, but suddenly stopped dead in their tracks. I looked over my shoulder and saw Jessica standing there with a .22 caliber pistol in her hand, which she had obviously pulled out of her purse. Go to the window on the other side of the room, you assholes, she snapped. They did as they were told, 
and I dragged the groaning and screaming big man past them. While Jessica was pointing a gun at them, I called 911. No wonder Amber was drugged. Three jerks were arrested and fired. Jessica and I received an award and bonuses from XYZ, and Jessica received an award from the National Environmental Protection Agency, and her concealed carry permit and pistol were featured on the cover of the monthly edition of the National Environmental Protection Agency. My aunt, uncle, and mother fawned over me. My uncle cried when he hugged me the next day before going to pick up George and then Amber from the hospital. Jessica and I received our bonus checks and spent a long weekend together. As with Judy, Jessica and I did not foresee a long-term relationship in the future, but we enjoyed satisfying each other for about five months until our passion cooled down. However, my constant problem was that often when I satisfied Jessica, I imagined Amber drugged, lying on a bed in a hotel room with her hands tied to poles while I satisfied her half to death. It's not healthy, I said to myself, and this became something I talked about with my unofficial psychologist. George really sincerely thanked me after the attempted rape incident. In fact, he didn't treat me any better soon after, but at least he was sincere in his gratitude. Amber, on the other hand, was still the same ass. While she was smiling and thanking me in front of her parents as they left the room, she said, even a piece of shit like you can do something right for once in your life. Don't bother your head about it, you idiot, and sauntered away. About six months after the Christmas party, I heard a rumor that Amber was sleeping with a married vice president. It didn't really surprise me that she cheated, considering how selfish and lustful she was, and I didn't really give a damn because I hated her and almost hated George. About a month after I first heard this rumor, a conference related to our business was held in a city about 1,500 kilometers away. I was invited to it as a representative of XYZ Company. Imagine my surprise when, about a week before the conference, George invited me to have lunch with him. After George assumed his usual pose and casually talked about the local sports teams, a thoughtful expression appeared on his face that I had never seen before. Greg, please be honest with me by answering a few questions, he whispered. I'll try, I said, a little taken aback. You don't like Amber, do you? After a short pause and looking around to see who might be nearby, I asked, George, you're not writing this down, are you? No, he stammered. Empty all your pockets and take off your jacket, I said. He looked at me strangely, but did as I asked. After the examination, I said, okay, this is not to tell anyone from the family about it, but I hate this fool. I'm sorry, but just thinking about her gives me goosebumps. I didn't mention that it also makes my organs stand up. Would you tell me if she was having an affair? I could if I had real evidence, I said. What's the matter? I feel that she is unhappy. Maybe she's just hanging around because according to our prenuptial agreement, he continued before I interrupted him. Do you have a prenuptial agreement? I asked. Yes. According to the prenuptial agreement, if she cheats on me before my trust fund arrives, she won't get anything from it. It's a lot of money. My grandparents were rich and separated from my father and aunt before they died, so they left everything to me in a trust fund. I will get access to them in two years. I'm not a private investigator, I said in a knowing tone, not sarcastic. I know, but you hate Amber and you have the honesty that the attempted rape incident demonstrated. Amber is going to the same conference as you next week. Please, I'm begging you. Tell me if you see anything suspicious. I'll do whatever you want, he said in a pleading, submissive tone that was very different from his usual arrogant tone. I thought about it a bit. He started to say something, but I just raised my hand and said, I'll think about it. In the end, I decided that if she was cheating, it gave me a potential opportunity to take revenge and bring some suffering into her life. All right, George, I muttered. If I get any real information at the conference, not just assumptions or rumors that she is cheating, I will tell you about it. However, you must never disclose this to anyone, and you will only use my information to hire a private investigator and use only his or her testimony if you want to divorce Amber. Thanks, dude. Thank you so much, he murmured excitedly. Wait, that's not all. I'm not just doing this because I hate Amber, I said. If I find out something worthwhile and you end up getting divorced, I want to get $10,000 from your trust fund. Tomorrow we will go to a lawyer, discuss with him or her, and with both of us the issues of attorney-client privilege, and then inform him or her about the deal. 
I got it, dude, thanks. George exclaimed enthusiastically, and then enthusiastically began to eat his previously untouched lunch. The conference lasted all Tuesday, all Wednesday, and then around 4 p.m. on Thursday. The vice president she was rumored to be dating, Chad Simmons, was also there. I wasn't really sure if I was going to check on Amber or not, but the likelihood of it increased because Simmons was there. Simmons was a man who was never kind to me and did not support the XYZ engineering department, so his dismissal would not have bothered me at all. On Tuesday evening, after the conference dinner, I overheard Amber, as I expected, talking to George on her mobile phone from the hotel lobby and telling him how tired she was during the day and that she was going to go to bed early. After that, I secretly followed her and Simmons and saw them. Separately, both into room 612, just a few doors down from my room 619. There was a party after dinner on Wednesday. Simmons got completely drunk. When he was leaning back in his chair, with a shit on his face, Amber and two other women were sitting in the booth. Amber glared at him. I came over. Girls, I said to the women in the booth. It looks like I should escort Mr. Simmons to his room. Do you know which one it is? Take the key card out of his pocket, Amber replied politely, since there were other women nearby. I took out a card and handed it to her. He's in room 612, she said, looking at the key. I don't know if she thought she was fooling anyone, because the room numbers aren't on the key cards, but I played along. Can you help me take him upstairs? I asked Amber. Okay, she growled, and then caught herself, because there were two other people nearby, and said in a pleasant voice, That's really nice of you, Cousin Greg. After we took him to his room, I smiled slyly at Amber and said, It looks like he won't be able to satisfy you tonight. How sad it is for you. Fuck you, asshole. We don't sleep together, she said defensively. Then why did you spend last night here? I asked. This confused her. Look, you don't know what you're talking about. Maybe George will believe you instead of me. I retorted with the air of a cat who has just eaten a canary. I turned and walked out the door. As I opened the door to room 619, I turned to room 612 and saw Amber watching me with a stern expression on her face. I took a shower, put on clean boxers, my usual sleeping clothes, and lay down on the bed to watch TV. There was a knock on the door. I turned off the TV, went to the door and asked, Who's there? This is Amber. We need to talk, was the reply. I opened the door and saw that she was standing in a bathrobe and high heels. I couldn't tell if she was wearing anything else. Amber brushed past me and stopped at the foot of the bed. Greg, let me be honest, she began. Are you going to call me Greg now instead of asshole? Or something like that? I asked, smiling. Would you rather I called you that? What is it? She asked, crossing her arms over her chest. Then I'd know it was really you, and not some cyborg who looked like you, I retorted. Okay, she replied after a pause. Asshole, let me be honest. I need you not to tell George about Simmons. Even if you're wrong, I think George is suspicious, and that could cause a scandal. If you want me to listen to you, you have to be honest, I said, emphasizing the word honest. Admit that you're sleeping with Simmons. If it were possible to kill with a look, then the imaginary lightning bolts from her piercing green eyes would strike me dead. After I stared back at her for a full 30 seconds, she said, Okay, I admit that Simmons and I slept last night. Just please don't tell George. Think about what would happen to mom and dad if they found out. Don't play on my love for your parents, I snapped. I hate George almost as much as I hate you. So I probably wouldn't have told him if it wasn't for the fact that you're sleeping with Simmons. If it was someone else in XYZ, I wouldn't care. What kind of problems do you have with him? She replied, crossing her arms more tightly over her chest. He's a jerk. I think he should be to satisfy you but he also always belittles engineering. If I report him to management, he will be fired for sexual harassment and my life in the engineering department will get better. If George finds out too, I'll get back at you for how shitty you've been to me all my life, I said, smiling from ear to ear. So if I'd slept with someone else at work, you wouldn't have told George? What is it? She asked hesitantly. Probably not. If I agree to break up with Simmons by telling him that someone threatened to file a sexual harassment complaint against him, won't you tell George? This is step one, I said. After another long pause, with a glint of awareness in her eyes, she took off her robe, 
showing off her gorgeous naked body. You want to satisfy me, don't you? She chuckled. When I took off my boxers, showing off my rock-hard organ, proud more than ever, I was honest. Yes, since I saw you naked in the bathroom. My psychologist? Your psychologist? She interrupted. Yes, my psychologist tells me that I have the strongest reaction of hatred and lust for you that he has ever heard of, and the only way to get rid of both of them is to satisfy you senseless. With that, I walked up to her. I hate you, she growled as I laid her on my bed. I didn't sleep much that night, but for the first time in my life, I was fine. Amber had too many of them to count. Besides, it was the first time in my life that I made love without kissing the woman I was sleeping with. I tried once, but she turned away, and I was too busy with her gorgeous body to worry about it. We had to come to the first morning meeting of the conference. First I took a shower, got dressed, and then I was sitting on the edge of the bed, covering my face with my hands, when Amber leisurely came out of the bathroom. Why are you such a gloomy asshole? She asked in her usual sarcastic tone. The main reason is that I thought that if I satisfied you once, I would get rid of the hatred and not want to sleep with you again. I really, really hate to say this, but you're making love better than I thought was possible in the real world, and now I have to satisfy you again. Only after the conference, she giggled, sleeping with your married cousin. I would call it terrible. As you often delicately pointed out when we were children, we are not blood relatives. There are no perversions here. I'm just going to sleep with a woman with a disgusting temper. I quipped. For some reason, I suddenly wanted to kiss her. I stood up, roughly pulled her to me, and passionately exchanged saliva with her. Do you think you can kiss me just because you're my best lover in the world? She growled. This ambiguous, though highly laudatory comment was probably the only compliment she had ever given me in her life. Yes, damn it, I replied, kissing her again. After the conference, we had breakfast. I extended the stay in my room until Thursday evening, while Amber moved her things from her room to mine. While she was moving her things, I called George on his cell phone, the number he gave me specifically for this purpose. Hi, George, I have good news and bad news, my cliché began. Damn it, he exclaimed. Tell me the bad news first. Amber will stay here for one more night because the conference will last late, and she has additional responsibilities. Today, she and I are working on a project together. When she calls to tell you, pretend to be surprised, but I wanted you to know that it's not because of intrigues with the guy I thought was the most likely suspect that she was having an affair. Amazing, he practically giggled. What's the good news? I saw her slap the guy who approached her, and I've never seen her mess with anyone else, despite the opportunities for that. Thanks, dude. I owe you. That means you won't get $10,000, he chuckled. George is an asshole, as always, I thought to myself, but I didn't say anything. No, but I thought about it a little more and decided that telling you about it was the right decision. So I would have refused the money even if the news had been different. I'll think of some way to thank you, he chirped. After Amber called George, we hung a do not disturb sign on the door and, except for a few times when we fainted from fatigue and had dinner in the room, we tried to please each other to death. This time there were kisses. Our holiday at the hotel took place almost three months ago. Since then, Amber and I have continued to insult each other daily in sleep, usually three times a week. I really wish I could stop, but I can't for two reasons. The first reason is that I satisfy her best of all, by such a wide margin that there is not even a second place in sight. In fact, incredibly, making love is getting better. The second reason is that the scientists conducting the lust-hate study are writing an article exclusively about my relationship with her, anonymously, of course. They interview me by phone every week, and I even got Amber to share her thoughts with them on a weekly basis. We don't tell each other what we tell the psychologists and other scientists, and they don't tell us what the other person said either. This is very bad, because while it's easy to understand why I hate her, I'd really like to know why she hates me, if that's really the case. I'm still trying to deal with my feelings. To be honest, I hate this woman, but when I satisfy her with pleasure, it's like I'm on top of Mount Everest. So far, I'm just watching my organ in her body and not worried about it. 